Well, good morning. Glad to see everyone. I missed you guys last week. If you weren't here, you probably didn't know I wasn't here either. I was here. I was just sitting in the back. I wasn't up here on stage, which meant y'all got out early. Um, Pastor Ben, I talked last week, and I'm just going to be really honest with you. I felt like he talked way too fast. Just way too fast, but um, anyway, sorry about that, guys. I'm working with him on it, okay? Um, <laughs> and that's a joke. Um, so if, we didn't go out of town or anything. It was Thanksgiving. Uh, family stayed in town, but um, our kids now, um, we've homeschooled up until this year, which, you know, that's why they always wear denim and, you know, all that kind of stuff, and that's a joke. Um, and uh, so they, they started the Avangrove Charter uh, this year. They're enjoying school, but it's kind of complicated our schedule because we used to take Fridays off together as a family, and that was neat. And you now they have to go uh, to school on Fridays, which is sad, but I guess they're supposed to do that. And So um, last week was Thanksgiving. They had a couple half days. If you're teachers, you love those half days. They make a lot of sense, don't they? Um, and uh, so they had a couple half days, and on Wednesday they were off. And so... It just made sense to me that I'd spend as much time hanging out with the family as possible. So I just, I didn't work on teaching or anything. So that's what Ben taught last week. And uh, so we kind of jumped in Thanksgiving and the Christmas stuff. We uh, decorated, we got these lights that go up behind the cross. And I was like, I really like those. And on the box, it said they're waterproof. So I decided I'd put them all over my house outside. And I uh, pushed a little button. They're staying up all year long. I'm really, really excited about that. Valentine's Day, my house is going to be all red. Really, I'm... <laughs> But I'm scared of heights, and so I, I, I rented a boom lift and parked it in the front yard and went up there and took care of lights. That was fun. Then um, we did Thanksgiving, and then we went and bought a, a Christmas tree, and you know, a live one. You know, uh, they make no sense to me. They're really big and expensive, and but we thought we want to kind of hurt the environment as well. So we'll go cut down live trees and. <laughs> I <laughs> brought it in, and everybody in our house, and they were sneezing, and all that kind of stuff, but, you know, it doesn't matter, because it's Christmas season, and so we have the pretty tree, and so did all the decorating, lots of fun, and then, I don't know, Friday or Saturday, I don't remember which day it was, we sat down, I got a, a, my oldest 11 is Briggs, Amelia's 7, and then Sophie's 5, and for the first time, we sat down in our house and watched um, Home Alone, the unedited version, by the way, and I had no idea. It's so weird when you look at this from a parent's lens versus when I was, I mean, Kevin McAllister, uh, Macaulay Culkin and I are the same age, so this is kind of, you know, the, this was my movie back in the day, how much you pick up and see, they're so mean to each other, they say all sorts of inappropriate things, and so our kids had these big earmuffs on during the whole movie, and <laughs> so you watched the hat, and so I was watching, it was fun, it was a fun movie. Um, by the way, a little piece of trivia, there's that moment in it where if you've seen the movie, I think most of you have, sorry if you haven't, uh, um, uh, Kevin is um, looking at Buzz up and he sees a picture of Buzz's girlfriend and he goes, ooh, Buzz, or Buzz's girlfriend, woof, which isn't very nice or appropriate, um, but I did read some trivia that the picture that they show there isn't a real female anywhere, so no one got their feelings hurt in that. In fact, they were sensitive to it that they actually put Buzz in a wig. And so the picture of Buzz's girlfriend, next time you see it, is actually a picture of Buzz, just uh, dressed up as a female so that no one gets offended except for Buzz in the, in the movie, just so you know. So, so we're watching it, and, you know, it gets to the, you know, kind of the climactic scene that's where, you know, Christmas Eve, the, these bad guys are going to come in and steal all the stuff, and Kevin, eight-year-old Macaulay Culkin, is, he's clever, and he comes up with all these different obstacles and booby traps to really, really damaged the, you know, the, the wet bandits, right? Joe Pesci, and, you know, and um, that's going on. And as I was watching it, I was just thinking, really, really interesting is, how does this little eight-year-old know exactly where they're going to go at all times, right? I mean, there's a lot that has to pl play out. He's got to walk up the stairs. He's got to get the tar. The shoe's got to come off. He's got to step on the nail. He's got to get tetanus, all that kind of stuff, right? And then, you know, the, the spider's got to be in the right spot at the right time. And so you're watching this, and you're going, I hope this works out. And I was thinking, man, it'd be so great if this time the movie changed. And Kevin's like, you can't get me. And then all of a sudden, they just get him and lock him up in a cage. And they roll the credits. No? Don't want to see it that way? Right? So you watch the movie, and you're like, oh, gosh, how does he know all this stuff? And, you know, because it, oh, it's a chain of events. There's a domino effect. They all have to happen in a certain order for the movie to make any sense. And you go, well, how in the world does Kevin know that? And here's the answer. He doesn't. The movie's not real. You follow? It's just not a real movie. The reason it happens in that way, in that category, is very simple. John Hughes. 
John Hughes is the writer of Home Alone and Home Alone 2, and then something happened in his life, and he wrote Home Alone 3, wouldn't have recommended it, but he does all those things. So John Hughes is this prolific writer, and the reason that whole movie plays out that way is because John Hughes charts it out. He also is the one who wrote Ferris Bueller's Day Off, Uncle Buck, all the, the Christmas Vacation, all the National Lampoons ones there, right? Miracle on 34th Street, that's also John Hughes. 101 Dalmatians, John Hughes. So this is a guy who writes a bunch, a bunch of movies, and it's only because of him and what he decides and designs that that movie plays out the way it does, right? If John Hughes doesn't write it, they don't step on the nail, they don't get hit in the face with a paint can, none of that happens. They don't step on the micro machines, and so behind the scenes of this fictional movie is a guy who's pulling all the strings, and that's our Christmas, right? And what it seems like for us, at least for me, that we get through this pageantry of Christmas, whether it's Santa Claus or Rudolph or Jesus, we kind of get them all mixed up and kind of think, are they all just fictional? Right? Is this just another story written that, so, that someone made up and because we want to jump in and enjoy the, you know, the most wonderful time of the year that we kind of jump into that, but we kind of just suspend disbelief thinking none of that's actually real. And so we can pile up all this other fiction and connect Christmas to it and connect this Messiah showing up in kind of the, the same vein and the same category, but it's not. And one of the things I get really concerned about as a pastor and looking at our culture is why I love that we all get to celebrate Christmas. I love that we sing joy to the world. The Lord has come. Let every heart prepare him room, right? There's some beautiful statements in that, and yet... I don't know that we pause long enough to go, is this really real? And here's what I'll tell you, it is real. And if that's the case, then let's think about John Hughes. The way that in which this great writer writes these great, uh, um, these great movies is that he's got a brilliant mind and comes up with really interesting uh, plot lines that kind of engage us and intrigue us, and we kind of jump in and get to go through that. And, you know, there's in a lot of these movies, there's kind of this set plot where there's nice scene in the beginning and things get bad and then they get good and then they get back to normal, right? So you got the everything is good, uh-oh, bad things happen, oh no, someone must save the day, and then all of a sudden at the end you get back to the place where everybody's happy again, right? And you go, well, where does he even get that thought line or that plot line from? And I would say it's in these scriptures that there's a different author who wrote a much more beautiful story. And here's the crazy thing. And if we read through the Bible in the Genesis, it actually says that in, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the way by which he does it, does it, it's crazy. Same way John Hughes wrote Home Alone with words. He speaks them and these things kind of play out. Light, darkness, universe, stars, sun, right? You, you see, and some of your signs are like, well, sun is actually a star. Okay, sorry, sorry, I'm sorry, right? And so you got all these different... He just speaks it, it happens, right? Just happens, just plays out. And so someone wrote it. You get to the New Testament. One of the authors of the New Testament, uh, John, one of Jesus' friends, his disciple, says, in the beginning was the Word, meaning these words that were spoken. The Word was God and was with God. And then it says later, that Word, that spoken Word, became flesh, meaning the gift of all that actually stepped onto this planet. That's the story of Christmas. And made his dwelling, his tabernacle, set up his tent, moved into the neighborhood among us. So for a second, even if you're like, ah, I'm not sure I believe all this, would you consider, could we consider, that maybe this is a true story? And if it's a true story written by the creator of the universe, there's something we got to think about because he's a much better writer than John Hughes is. John Hughes is made in God's image, but he's not God, right? He's a better writer than M. Night Shyamalan, right? You know, coming up with this clever line that, you know, the little boy sees dead people, whatever it is, all these different movies with these great kind of climactic moments. This guy's better. This God is better. And he writes his story. So you go, if the God of the universe in the very beginning was writing a story, and in that story he knew exactly what was going to happen. He knew how, how creation would happen. He knew how the damage and the brokenness in our world would happen. He knew how the rescue would take place. And he knew how he's going to put it all together at the end, right? All those things. If that's the case, if God is orchestrating this whole thing, then it makes sense we'd pause and go, okay, if he could have written any story, and he could have done whatever he wanted to, and he somehow decides that 2,000 years ago, he wanted to step onto the scene in flesh, Jesus, God's son, God himself, and invade our world as a baby in a manger in a town called Bethlehem, it would make sense that we'd pause and go, he could have written any story. He could have shaped it any way he wants. Why does he shape it this way? Hence, 
the reason we have this series called Wonder. Because it would make sense when we come up to some things that just don't make sense, that are inexplicable, inexplainable, you would just pause and wonder. By the way, that's why we call it the most wonderful time of the year, because this is a crazy story filled with wonder. And so Pastor Ben started last week with a brilliant understanding that God actually began writing the story long ago, and there wasn't some kind of accident. He goes, oh, i got to fix it now. This was always God's story. The way we know that, as we can see throughout the Old Testament, this, these inklings, these moments of foreshadowing, over 300 prophecies where God declared that he was going to make a way where there was no way. 300 prophecies pointing to the fact that God was going to send a rescuer, and it was going to be himself, Jesus. And that that rescuer is going to uh, declare a bunch of stuff and meet us and come and save us from our sins and make some pretty bold proclamations. Like uh, the enemies come to steal, kill, and destroy, but Jesus said, but I come to give you life. And guess what kind of life he came to give you? A full life. The same Jesus would tell, you, tell us that he is the way, the truth, and life, meaning everything we're looking for in this life is found in him. And people didn't get it or like it then as well, and they murdered him for it. And by the way, uh, at that point, uh, people were really sad. But all these writers we have and this movement that starts and the reason that 2,000 years later we celebrate this story of Christmas and not some other silly story is not because Jesus showed up on this planet as a baby. It's because everything he said he did and it became true. And the reason we know that, and history will capture this, is that Jesus is put on a cross for declaring he's God and to declare that he came to save the day. And it, they, he was murdered for it. And at that point, people didn't know whether or not it was true or not. But then he came back to life. And after he came back to life, there becomes this groundswell of a movement of this really true news that perhaps there is a God who made a way where there is no way. And the way by which he did it was by giving himself as the greatest gift. And that's what we celebrate at Christmas. And so what happened right, at, right after that is a bunch of people going, this is a crazy story. But it's not just a crazy story. It's a true story. And we got to make sure as many people hear this story as possible to the point where all these first century people are going and declaring this news. And guess what? They're getting murdered for the news as well. And some of Jesus' uh, first disciples are going, we got to write this story down because this has to be captured. Now, they thought they were just writing it down. They didn't know that the God of the universe was using their words to make sure 2,000 years later it would show up in our ears. Right? And so all this kind of takes place. And so in the beginning of the New Testament, there's these four guys, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And they all decide in some way or another to start this story of God's rescue plan with telling the story of Christmas. So a couple of these guys are eyewitnesses. They actually walked with Jesus, followed Jesus, then wrote the stories down. But one of the guys who uh, writes a story filled with wonder, by the way, is going, if this is true, if this is true, this changes everything. And he sets out to write a biography about Jesus' life. Now, this guy, so a couple of these people, these weren't original writers. They didn't go to NYU Screen Writing Guild or any of those kind of things. I mean, these guys had different jobs before. They were tax collectors and ministers. And one of them, particularly Luke, who we're going to talk about today, he was a, a doctor, a scientist. And in the middle of doing that, he hears this news and is it profoundly impacted it to the point where he starts really trying to figure out if it's true. Now, in order to do that, he needs time and energy and money. And this rich, mm, curious dude named Theophilus decides to pay kind of a, a research grant, a fellowship to Luke so he could go become an investigative journalist. So this guy, Luke, actually goes and um, we believe meets with, you know, eyewitness people. He would have met with Jesus' mother, Mary. He would have met with uh, Jesus' brothers and cousins. He would have met with, you know, religious and government leaders. And he would have put together a story. Because what he's saying is, if this is true, we got to figure it out. And so if this story is true and the author of the story is God, then we should probably pause, particularly in this time of year, to figure it out and go, is this worth considering or wondering? So if... You don't believe in this stuff. Really, really good week for you to be here to go. Maybe it's worth pausing and thinking about. If you do, maybe it's still worth pausing and going, what are the implications for my life as a result of this story? And what are the ramifications for our world and my family as a result? And so that becomes a story. So we're going to look at one of the writers. His name is Luke. And we're just starting at the beginning. So Luke decides to say, this story is true. You should wonder about it. But it's amazing. And so he's going to write the story to give us some confidence in this whole story of Christmas. And he decides to write it. So I'm going to start with his words. And we're just going to talk about them for the, I don't know, the next hour and a half or so. I wasn't here last week. 
Right, it's fair. Hope you brought the sandwich. Okay, here goes. Uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 1. There are uh, Bibles in front of you. You can read them there. Um, you can bring your own Bible. That'd actually be pretty bright and brilliant. You could write it down later. Or if you want to look up here on the screen, that's great. But you only get to do this once. So next week you need to bring your Bible. You can look on the screens this week. But if you don't bring your Bible next week, you're just going to stare at the floor the whole time I preach. Got it? No, just, no, you look down. Look down. No, I'm just joking. You can every time. Luke 1, verse 1, it says this. Many have undertaken uh, to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us. So Luke's going. A lot of people are trying to figure out this story is true, and they're investigating it, and they're writing all about it, right? Uh, just as they were handed down to... servants of the word. So they're going, the word, that's Logos, that's God. So what we understand here is he's going, many have tried to, at this point, the way by which we've captured this information is spoken word, right? If you've played the telephone game, you know how spoken word happens and how it gets off within, you know, just a couple iterations, right? And so therefore, Luke's going, hey, we've had this by spoken word, but let's figure out what's true about this story, right? Makes sense. Appreciate that he's doing that. Scientific, investigative journalist mind, verse 3. With this in mind, figuring out whether or not this is certain, figuring out whether or not it's true, figuring out what the actual story of Jesus is, right? With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. So he's going, I want to know whether it was true, you sent me to do it. Not only that, truth. I am now going to write it all down from start to finish so that you can understand this. By the way, he gets becomes so intrigued by the story, he not only writes the book of Luke, the gospel according to Luke, the good news about Jesus' life according to Luke, he decides to write the sequel, right? Home Alone 2, you follow me? He writes the book of Acts. He goes, not only is it such a crazy story about what Jesus did, it's even crazier that Jesus used a bunch of broken people to go invade this world with this good news. And so he, it's really interesting, if you, if you read through the book of Acts, he writes about, in, or, you know, he writes about the book. And then towards the end, he actually inserts himself into the book. Why is that? Because he becomes so intrigued by the story and so moved and transformed by the story, he becomes a player in the story. Right? I mean, this is, this is interesting. This has been like John Hughes writing himself in as this guy who comes in to Home Alone. Right? I mean, this is, this is profound that this writer steps into this true story. And so he's going, hey, Theophilus, you wrote, you paid me to go investigate it. I've investigated it. And now I'm going to investigate it. I've decided that I'm going to write about it. Now, here's what's really interesting. You want to point this out real quick. Nowhere in this does he go, God ordained this. <coughs> God told me, spoke to me, used an angel, came in and said, you're supposed to write a story about God's life. Do you see that? I'm affirm that not only was Luke operating in this way, God behind the scenes was orchestrating the whole thing. Right? And so it's so crazy about our stories that sometimes we're going, okay, we're going to try to do the right thing. And that right thing is actually being motivated and underwritten by the power and the might of the God of the universe. Now, it's really hard to see in the middle of that. And it's even more arrogant to stand up and declare it. Right? But what you can see about God in this really nuanced thing is there is this belief that we have this freedom to do all these things. And while we're doing these things, God is still behind the scenes orchestrating it the same way that you manage your two and three and four and five-year-olds, right? Right? And all those things. I mean, even last week during Thanksgiving, our kids, Sophie particularly, helped make macaroni and cheese. It was her macaroni and cheese? Sure it was. It was her dad's. It was her dad's and her dad's recipe. I made the roux. She just sat there and did this the whole time. And she took all the credit. <laughs> Right? This is all she did. Just did this the whole time. is Theophilus. That's the one who gets the original letter. He is God and his perfect stewardship doesn't just waste Luke's time and energy for one person. He is going to make this, these words available for all human history and perpetuity moving forward. Right? So it's timely for that moment, but it's timeless meaning. As, as Luke words specifically... you, for you, for you to read. Oh, so here's what I'm writing at Theophilus. So, therefore, here's the reason. We know the certainty 
that you may know the certainty of the things you've been taught. So Luke 2, and I'm going to start this book. I'm going to talk about the truth of this crazy story so people can wonder and marvel at it. And the reason I'm writing this is so that you can know the certainty. That word certainty there has to do with like um, firm grounding. It's like about stability. So you can know, Theophilus, so you can know everybody in this room that you are standing on firm and confident ground. This is not some fictional story. Everything that's written here, everything that's been exposed, everything we've discovered, it is all 100% true. You can be certain of these things. And what's going to happen, you're going to see in this story, is that there are going to be people who are going to be, oh, I'm not so certain of this, right? Same thing we do. We go, ah, that'd be really great if it's true, but really? A baby in a manger? That's God, right? Because we have ideas of if, if we're God and we're sending our son someplace, that's not the way we're doing it. That's not the way I'm doing it, right? My kid's dropping down into Times Square with a guitar, and he's, he's, he's right next to the naked cowboy. I'm sorry, naked cowboy. See, the southerners came out here, right? He just shows up, and he's, he's just right there with him, right? And they're going, oh, man, that's crazy, right? A manger in a little redneck town in the middle of chaos, right? That's the way he shows up. And so Luke's going, I just want you to know that it's all true so that you can stand certain and confident in this story. So that's the reason he write it. That's the thesis. So now we know. Okay. Really important. So Luke takes a few verses, four verses, uh, you know, a quick little intro. Remember, there's not a ton of ink. There's not a lot of paper. So every one of these words really, really matters. Um, and so he's going he's gonna to say, this is the reason. And so now what he's about to do, this is important in communication, is he's going he's gonna to set the hook. Right? He said, okay, if foundation, I'm telling you, the reason I'm writing all this is so that you'll believe it's true, then we can deduce that his next words are going to be really, really important for us to pay attention to this. So he's not going to start inserting characters into this, right? He's, gonna, he's, he's writing the story, and he's going to insert these characters. You know, these are true characters, and he's put together all the investigative part of it, and now he's going to kind of play it out. And so you go, who does Luke start with? Like, who is, who's the first person that shows up in the story? Ah, it probably should be Mary, right? Mary, like the 14-year-old virgin. That's a pretty big deal, right? We should, we, should, we should talk about her. Or maybe he starts way back in the day with one of these people who's reading that they're heroes. Maybe he goes with David or Moses or Abraham or Jacob, right? Maybe he goes all the way back to Adam. Who does he start with? Like, what's the hook? How does he get everybody into the story? How does he capture Theophilus in our attention? And he does something really, really strange here. He starts with this old unknown couple. He's going to start with old people. Don't have kids. Don't have legacy. Don't have anything. And you go, well, that's, that doesn't seem like very good writing. So this whole story of pageantry of Jesus, you got shepherds, you got wise men, you got stars, you got angels, and he starts with this old, unknown husband and wife. So why does he start there? We should probably wonder. Here it goes. You know, in the time of uh, Herod, king of Judah, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the pri priestly division of Abijah. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. Okay, so we got a couple of different things going on. He's going to now say, here's the reason I write all this. Foundation, I want you to be certain of the truth of this. And now let me tell you about a couple of people. Now, what he does here is he says, in the time of Herod. This is really important because this is how we kind of know about what year all this happens, right? So, um, familiar, we, we, we kind of... Uh, split our time based on this crazy story of Jesus' arrival. You, you grew up with A.D. and a domino, the, the year of our Lord in Latin, or B.C., before Christ. So there was this time before Christ, and then A.D., this time in which Christ is inserted, and we kind of see that as, you know, negative numbers on the timeline, no positive numbers on the timeline, right? Zero kind of changes it. The reality is more like three or four B.C., or um, uh, three or four, uh, so it's a couple of years off in terms of how all this plays out. There's, there's a there's a reason for that. Kind of the Gregorian calendar gets messed up. Not, not worth talking about here. But we can say with pretty good certainty about the time, a year or two, within the time frame of when this happens as a result. I'm sorry, 480. Um, as a result of King Herod being in the picture. We have a timeline on when he's there. So we're going, okay, we know about when this is. So uh, Luke set the stage going, this is a time when Herod was reigning. And here's this old couple. Here they are. Let me tell you about the old couple. And it says this. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God observing uh, the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. So Luke inserts this couple, tells you a little bit about them. He's a priest. This is really, really important because first century um, Judaism, these folks had not quite come to the conclusion that they couldn't fix the problem. 
they're not they're still going up we're not out of the woods yet but we think we see light at the end of the tunnel if we can behave better we can rally the troops to sin less give more sacrifice more so there's this these priestly duties of going maybe 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 we can fix this and not only did Zechariah come from this godly group, you also have um, Elizabeth who comes from Moses' brother's lineage. I mean, so this is a really good pedigree. These are pretty special people, probably not well-known, but pretty special people. I mean, he's not a high priest. He's one of the priests. And it says in the, uh, the, the vision of Abijah, one of the things to understand there, there's, um, there's 24 divisions of priests. There's about 18,000 priests at the time. So there's lots of people that cover lots and lots of responsibility and they, they do all sorts of stuff, right? Uh, and so um, they would have been the money changers at the temple. They would have been collecting in the temple two, two weeks a, a year it says 48 weeks about two right you got a remainder of three four depending on the calendar um they would they'd come into the temple and they'd take care of it okay so they would leave their homeland and they'd come back to jerusalem and they'd be responsible for the temple they'd be taking care of the temple doing those things and so these different priests would show up now well, so uh, uh, so zechariah was one of these guys and so about two weeks a year maybe three depending on the year he would leave his family that's just his wife kids, none of that, right? He'd come into Jerusalem. Our Luke's saying, here's these two people. Uh, Zechariah, he's a priest. Elizabeth comes from a good pedigree. And it says a couple things. They um, were righteous in the sight of God, and they observed the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. That word blamelessly doesn't mean they were without sin. It just meant they didn't do something so egregious that God spotlighted his judgment on them, right? So these are not perfect people, but they're not people who are doing horrific things that paper. Yep. And so uh, that set seven, it changes there. You see that word, but you see it in the scriptures, the mood usually changes. So really good people. Luke kind of starts with a, hey, let me tell you about these two people, good pedigree, religious, care for things. They, you know, their religion believed that they could earn God's love and affection and believe that if they didn't do right, God would, they'd have pain and sorrow that God would punish them for, right? So you got all this, and then verse 7, it says this, but they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive. And they were both, there it is, very old, very old, very old. So this is an old couple. They don't have any legacy. And we find out later in verse 24, 25, that this causes a great deal of disgrace and shame and pain for them, particularly Elizabeth. And so we look at this. And so this is really, really interesting. So Luke decides to start this uh, story of we can be confident and certain of God's truth with these two people. None of you probably can um, connect with, understand, uh, have kind of a similar experience of Immaculate conception. Right? None of you have gone, well, the Holy Spirit impregnated me. Right? Anybody in the room? No, I'm just joking. Don't raise your hand. That'd be really uncomfortable for all of us, right? <laughs> right? I mean, none of us can go, yeah, I had that experience. Boy, he's speaking my language. I know what that's like to have an angel show up and go, you're going to have a baby. But, right? None of you have had that experience. Starts with the one that we actually have this experience. Right? Can you imagine this? Can you imagine month after month, year after year, taking some of you had that experience, and don't want to trivialize your experience because it, you know, it's absurdly painful. And um, it was really, really painful then too. And there is some additional um, complications. Uh, Two thousand years ago, that uh, the value of a woman was put on her ability to have children. Sad, but it was true. Right? I mean, men did the work. It's very misogynistic culture. All those kind of things. And so, women, their jobs were to birth children. Lots of them take care of the property and so you got that piece the second piece is there were no 401ks there were no retirement plans right you didn't give a little bit of money and you know get you know this pension later on the plan for adults was they had lots of kids and when they got old their kids would take care of them part of the culture these guys are on up in age really on up in age death is staring them down and no one's going to keep up with them like they could die in their house and people may not know for years right it's that kind of complicated culture so their plan for retirement and pension and all those things and care there were no convalescent centers there was no hospice it was all underwritten by family so you got this couple this lady particularly goes this is how i find my identity and value and that's not even a possibility for me this is how i find my security and provision later in life that's not even a possibility and even greater this is where it gets really complicated in in kind of jewish belief system they were curious about what eternity looked like or how you got access to it 
Okay, there's a Messiah. What is that Messiah going to do? Is he going to go save us from political, you know, oppression? And one of the, the guiding beliefs for many of them was that one day God would make things right. And as long as their family was there and available to that moment of rightness, all of a sudden they would get inserted into the rightness of the kingdom. Right? And so the way by which immortality happened was actually through your offspring, your genealogy. That's why you read so much about genealogies in the scriptures, because there is this belief that if you were from the right line, one day God would make all things right, even through the line of David. And guess what that would mean for David? He would get inserted into the kingdom. Right? And that's why you see David in Psalms talk about the, the, the child he lost, little bitty baby, miscarried. He says, one day I'll see into the kingdom, they would get access to it. Guess what happens when these two people die? Their opportunity to get into the kingdom is all gone. And this false belief system. So they don't, uh, this identity is broken. Their you know, security provision is, is taken away. And even their access to the kingdom of God and eternity they all are looming as a result of not having kids. So this is a place of deep pain. And you know, maybe you don't have that pain, right? Maybe you don't have the pain of I've been asking the Lord to allow us to have a child. And that's annoying to you, right? And some of you are even uh, frustrated about Christmas because people will start asking again, when are you going to have the next one? Or when are you going to have it? Or are you just going to have an only child? Whatever it is. And they have no clue what you guys have been working on for the last six months, year, two years, and the pain that comes every single month. Right? And so for many of you, this is a, a very... Very simple connection. Go, yep, I identify with that wholeheartedly. You know, others maybe it's not, you know, you're not trying to have a baby. In fact, you're biologically not capable. You're a male or whatever that stuff is. And you, you got other things. You're going, I've been praying and I've been begging and been asking the Lord to come through. I've been asking him to relieve me of this addiction. My child's, would you bring some sobriety here? Would, would you give me that raise? Would you heal my marriage? Right, would you restore my family, store my parents, right? You have all these different things you've been praying over and over and over and over and over. Honest with you. Um, in terms of skepticism, many of you, I think myself in this category, is real. It's not like many of you read a book by Richard Dawkins and go, yep, makes a good point. There's just nothing out there, right? Maybe. Maybe a very tiny percentage are going, that's the case, right? Man, you made a really good point. I guess it's just hope and bleak. I'll be hopeless and, or hopeless and bleak. I'll just be that too, right? Most of us, most of us, our skepticism and our cynicism towards God, and even to the story about Jesus as a baby, is experiential. Because you've gone, if God is really, really good, then why does this pain never stop? Like, why has God not healed my child? Why did I get that diagnosis? I'm the one who eats healthy. Right, I see people all around us, right? You, you know the story. You get lung cancer, and you've never ever smoked a pack of cigarettes in, or a single cigarette in your life. And you know people who've smoked a carton a day. And they're in their 90s, still smoking away, drinking their Jack and Coke. And you're going, how in the world does this work, right? And then you got kids holding them up as the example, right? My kids do that. My dad eats donuts every single day for breakfast. Never been in the hospital. Eats horribly. Great help. Playing softball all the time. So they're going, see, dude, that's what they call him. Um, they, uh, he gets to eat donuts every day, right? This is, so it's just so weird. And you got people who eat so healthy, right? We all know people who in their early 40s were jogging because they were in great health and fell over in cardiac arrest in the middle of that. And you go, how in the world does that work? Right? You see marriages, you go, how do they make it and we don't? Or, man, how does that person get the promotion? I work hard, I show up early, I don't cheat, I don't take office supplies, whatever it is, right? <laughs> and they get the promotion. And so all of us, this, the cynicism that kind of creeps in, I think this is the category of us going, yeah, it's hard for us to believe the Christmas story. Because that's experientially, if God can make a, send himself in human flesh and make himself as a baby and then grow up, die on a cross, and then come back to life, he definitely can. Look at that tumor and say, go away, and it should be able to go away. And so if it does it, either he's not real or he's not loving. And all of us kind of walk in this, and all of us in some category or another are pretty suspicious and cynical. And there's a re reason for that. Because our world is suspicious and cynical. Right? We are relieved every morning when we open up our phone and there wasn't a, another gun shooting in the middle of the night. Like we're relieved every single day when there's not a terrorist attack. Like you look at our world, and it's just really, really broken, and you go, yep, not sure what to do about it, but how in the world does a good God exist in this world? 
So it makes sense if Luke is trying to help us understand the story of what Jesus came to do and how it fits into our lives and our souls and our world. It makes sense he'd start with people who are in pain and suffering like you and I are in pain and suffering. So he starts with these people and helps us understand. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive. That is a deep statement of disgrace and shame. And they were both very old. So at this point, they have no good expectations. They're going, I guess, hopefully... I die comfortably in my bed and someone thinks to check on me. That's their hope in this. And that's their story. And Luke, in the first seven verses, have explained what he's trying to help us, convince us that this, you can be certain of this truth. And then he inserts these true, real people, godly people. It even says they're godly and blameless, meaning this isn't God's punishment for them, but he's aware and he's in it. So that's the story we have. These people who are suspicious and cynical and broke and sad. So if you've got any of those kind of uh, characteristics in your life, welcome to the team. Let's see what God does with it. Verse 8. Once when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn an incense. So, like I told you, there's 12 different divisions, two uh, weeks a year. Different priests would come into the city of Jerusalem and take care of the temple, and they'd have different duties, but the, the chief of the duties was burning the incense. So if you don't know much about um, the temple, that's fine. Uh, uh, but here's kind of how it works. There's this big temple in Jerusalem that they would declare that God dwelt there. Now, uh, God was veiled. He gave it very little access to his heart because people had done really uh, disappointing, inappropriate, uh, disrespectful things to the God of the universe. And they basically looked at God every single day and said, we're not interested in you until things got bad. And then they come back to him. And so the way by which God kind of set it up is there's this big temple. And what they understood, that they understood that the way by which they got access to God was to acknowledge that they couldn't earn the access on their own. But this goes about all the way back to Genesis when Adam and Eve are dealing with they're naked and they hide and they blame each other. People shame and disgrace and their immediate response is to cover themselves up and they understood that the only way to operate in this really broken world would be to have some cover. So when you want to hide, you want to misrepresent the truth, when you want to do those things, progression of a broken world that we all feel put fig leaves over their body and that wasn't enough to, to wither and so God shows up and says, there's going to Work's going to be hard, so it's childbirth. And then he gives uh, Adam and Eve some good news. But hey, one day, proto evangelium or evangelium, and, and uh, chapter 3, he says, Through your offspring, there'll be a Messiah. He's pointing to Christmas. And then immediately after that, what happens is he, um, he says, You're going to have to go out of the garden. You can't stay in this access place anymore because you, 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 you can't live. He, he does something really, really unique. There's an animal that walks by, he slaughters it. And it's the animal. Didn't, <laughs> didn't do anything wrong. Just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. And God slaughters it. There's shed blood in that. And God literally takes the leather of that body for their shame. And that point forward, they all decisions and sin and to cover their bodies, right? And so the, the temple was a place by which they would go seek that covering. And so there'd be sacrifice. animals that would be sacrificed. There, there'd be so as they got closer, there'd be certain rituals and things to get themselves clean and as the, as to save them, but to help them understand how this in the inside of the temple. Poor, uh, one priest would go in and say, God, we are asking you to cover our sins for another year. We understand this is a band-aid, but until there's a permanent solution, we're asking you to do this. And one priest would go and intercede on behalf of everybody. The whole community would be outside praying. But often what would happen is around the other side of the veil, there was this other little altar. It's called the altar of incense. And this is a reminder each week that God was their provision and their provider. And he one day would make all things new. And um, what happened um, when these priests would come in for their you know, traveling itinerant priest time during the week, uh, they would take these thousand or you know, 750 priests and they would draw lots. And five of them would get the opportunity to participate in the altar of incense. And some of them would get the incense, some of them would prepare the table. And one, one of them, one of them would get to go and actually participate in the, in, uh, the burning of the incense, right? And what we see here is Zechariah was chosen by Lot. So complete coincidence. He just happened to go in the basement, walk up the steps, step on the micro machine, machines, get hit with the paint can, right? Like this is... Obviously, there's an orchestrator behind all this, right? A conductor doing all the work. And so Zachariah gets chosen for this. Probably the only time he ever gets chosen. This is a really significant deal. And so watch what happens with his chosenness. 
He was chosen by lot according to the custom uh, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. So they're going, God, would you please, please make a way where there is no way. God, would you please, please come through. Would you allow us to have children? Would you, all those same kind of requests we have, right? Verse um, 11, then an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing at the right side of the altar of the incense. So um, Zechariah's in there and all of a sudden a guest shows up. Now, a couple of things to point out here. Uh, first, I'll point out the, the, the easy part. Um, you see where it says that the right of the side of the altar of intents? There is no symbolism there. So like, well, on the left side, that would have been a tinier angel, but a little bit more chubby, you know, a little plumpy. He'd been like one of those baby cherubims, like the little precious moments ones, right? And they go on the left, the right side. They're the big mighty ones, the big muscles, nice abs. None of that, right? This isn't what that's saying in any way, right? What, <laughs> there's literally no reason to tell us it's on the right. I said abs. Just want to be clear, okay? Um, so stay on the right side of the altar of incense. There's no reason for him to tell us that other than he knew it and thought he'd share it. So this is, again, uh, seeing that this is an eyewitness account, this is like a footnote, right? Um, do you want to tell if someone's lying? Listen to the vagueness of the story or how it changes with each, each rendition, right? So what we see here is Luke going, nope, I had a conversation, maybe with Zechariah himself. He told me where he was and what happened. Now, the other thing I'd say about angels is most people are like, oh, they're so cute. Did you know one in three people have said they've had an experience with an angel? Most of them have to do with a car wreck, being pulled out, whatever that kind of stuff is. But when we think about angels and those interactions, we see these cute little, you know, babies with wings and halos, right? Yeah, that kind of stuff. And, or maybe you think on the Ouija board, the angel of dark, maybe you've had that kind of experience. But one in three people kind of do that and most or say that they've had that experience. And most of them have this really like, oh, it was so nice and so like serene. There's never a time in the scriptures where an angel shows up and they go, oh, that was serene. In fact, every single time you see it in the scriptures, the people that were standing there with the angels, all of them wish they had on diapers. Every single time they're like, oh, this would be a good time to put those depends on, right? Right? Zachariah's like, got to make a trip to Costco, whatever that is, right? You got all those things going on. And so Zachariah's there. And so he sees it and writes this, verse 12. When Zachariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. He was scared, gripped with fear. He is overwhelmed, and you can see this every time when angels show up. They're kind of going to go, hey, hey, no, no, take a deep breath. It's okay. Right? Watch. Verse 13. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid. Zachariah says, a little late, bro. Can I go change my pants? Right? Um, uh, uh, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. Wait. I've always wanted to have a son. I thought I'd call him Zach Jr. Or actually, my daddy was Zach the first. Zach Jr. is me. He'd be Zach the third. We were going to call him Trip. Ha <laughs> ha. You know, whatever it is, right? So, um, or he's, you know. Uh, yeah, sorry. I was going to, I was going to, yeah, forget. We're going back in. So it says, uh, so grip the fear. Zachariah, your prayer has been heard. So he's going, you're going to have a baby. And Zach's like, I'm really, really old. Um, no. Uh, the angel's going to give him a description of who uh, John the Baptist, this baby's going to be. He will be a joyful delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He will never take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. Now, there's some conversation about that as it does with prohibition and, you know, abolition of, you know, alcohol, whatever those things are. And um, some, th this literally is translated, no wine, no beer. So you're going, aha, he can have hard liquor. I don't think that's what it's saying here. But this isn't also saying don't drink at all. I don't have time to cover all that. This is very focused on John the Baptist in this moment saying, hey, we got a focus, laser focus, very direct calling on your life, and nothing needs to get in the way of that, right? If you got more questions about that, feel free to write them down. We cover a podcast on Tuesdays on questions. Back your bulletin, you can write it down. Or you can email it to overtime at clcfamily.church. We'll cover it on Tuesday. You can listen to it next week. And so we get that, and we get some more understanding of Zach, uh, John the Baptist. And this is what it says. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. So he's going to point people back. That word John literally in the Hebrew means um, Yahweh's grace, Yahweh's gift to us. So he's going to give us a gift. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and the power of Elijah. Now watch this. To turn the hearts of the parents to their children. Right? See in the beginning. The very first thing that God institutes is marriage. Say, and then the very first thing that gets messed up is marriage. Right? Blaming. All that kind of stuff. And then God, the second thing God institutes is family. He has kids. And the next thing you see is brothers killing and murdering each other. And so from the very beginning of time, you see this broken mess in marriage and family. And God is going... Not only is he going to be a forerunner for salvation, he's actually going to start taking care of these institutions that were broken from the very beginning. I want to pray about something in our communities, in our world. Pray about marriages 
and pray about families, right? One of every two kids who is born right now will be born without a dad in his home, right? So you see this, and, and, and in this moment, this angel's going, John, you're going to send John, and he's going to point people to the reconciliation of those things, to parents of children and that are disobedient to the wisdom and the righteousness. Now watch this to make ready people prepared for the Lord. So to be very clear, you're going to have a son, Zechariah, and he's going to do two things. He's going to point people to and prepare people for Jesus, the baby who is God himself. So that's this role, right? And so Zechariah, you think, oh, if I've been praying, I got this good dude, but he's probably going, wait, I'm old. Couldn't even give me in my 30s. I'm not going to be able to throw football. I've got this rotator cuff issue, whatever that is. I don't know. But verse 18, watch how Zechariah responds. Zechariah asked the angel, how can this be? How can I be sure of this? Wait, I'm looking for some certainty. You want me to put some stable ground there? And you do the same thing, right? You, you give each other this advice. Don't spend the money before it's in the bank. That's wise, right? You have a hard time when you think you're going to get the promotion, not tell anybody just in case. And think about many of you have gotten the news that you've conceived. Wait till that first trimester, second trimester. Why? Because there's just so many things that could go wrong. So Zachary is going, look, I just want some stability. This I've been praying forever. I understand you're an angel. I'd like to trust it, but how can this be? So he is suspicious and cynical, the God of the universe. And this guy's going, I am an angel and I'm here. And then Zachariah explains exactly why he's so cynical. Watch what he says here. I am an old man and my wife is well along in years. You're like, ah, good diplomacy. He calls himself old and he just kind of reshapes it. That's not at all what's happening here in the Greek. Well along in years means a lot older than old, right? So he calls himself old. He's going, look, my wife is so old, she sleeps in a tomb just because it's easier if she don't wake up. That's what he's saying here. Like, this is, this is not a nice term. He is going, I'm old. No, she, like, you see her, like, she is wrinkled, 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 right? Like, I mean, like, so this is, this is not nice, and this is so ridiculous. Poor Elizabeth. Here we are 2,000 years talking about her, and again, we're just calling her old, right? First thing, the only adjective we see about Elizabeth is she's old and happy, right? Old. And we see it when she shows up with Mary. We'll see it next week. <laughs> it says, you know, Elizabeth, the old one with the kid, right? So it's just not fair, but he goes, I am old. She's really old. I'm talking about like really, really, really old. I saw her sneeze. It was all dust, <laughs> you know, like really old, right? <laughs> so this is not nice, and there is punishment involved. You should be happy about this if you're old and your husband calls you old. Then the angel said to him, I am Gabriel, Gabriel, Jabril, depending on how you pronounce that. So he's going, like, this is, this is like a, he's, he's looking at him and going, I am like, I am a spokesman for the God of the universe. I stand in the presence of God, and I've been sent to speak to you and, you and tell you this good news, and now you'll be silent and not be able to speak until the day this happens. Because, why, why? You did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. So we can see a couple things here. He literally strikes um, him mute, and this is what it says next, verse 21. Meanwhile, the people waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple, when he came out, he could not speak to them. <coughs> This is weird. Like, this is a really bad game of charades. You know what I'm saying? And they're like, you saw an angel on the outfield, right? And he keeps going. He's going, we're Lassie. Is the boy stuck in the well? Like, I don't know what's going on here, right? You got these things going on. So in the temple, when he came out, he could not speak. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple, for he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. When the time of service was completed, he returned. So he goes home, can't speak. We know he can't speak for about nine, a little over nine months, right? Because he hasn't even conceived, they haven't conceived yet. And if you read verse 62, not only can he speak, when they're trying to decide the name of John later, they actually are saying, you should name him Zechariah. And they're saying that to him. And the way by which they're saying to him is they're making signs to him. You don't make signs to people if they can hear. So not only can he not speak, he probably can't hear either. So this is a deaf and mute dude for a while. And you're going, is this God's punishment? This is really where we can be suspicious. Is that what God does if we don't behave when we're uh, cynical? Because we're all in trouble then, right? You're in trouble. I'm in trouble if we're cynical of what God says he's going to do. Because he made some real good promises in our life that we, haven't, we don't cling to most days. So is this punishment? Hmm. Really important, particularly if you're a parent, but also for all of us. There's a big difference between punishment and discipline. Big difference. Huge difference between punishment and discipline. Huge difference. Right? And here's the thing I'd say. God doesn't punish you can't punish you, will not punish you, particularly those of you who are a follower of Christ, and here's the reason why. Well, we understand the Bible says the wages of your sin is death, meaning the punishment you deserve is death. You deserve death. You deserve eternal, by death you mean disconnection, eternal disconnection from God, eternal disconnection from life. Death is what you deserve. But then the Bible goes on and says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus, our king. So literally, Jesus shows up on this planet, and he puts handcuffs on death and goes, nope, doesn't get near my people. Literally, puts handcuffs and arrests death, and then invites life 
for us. He goes, no, no, it doesn't get my people. So here's what that means. That means God actually, through Jesus, pays all of your punishment. All of your punishment paid for by God. So here's what you got to understand there. If you, therefore, are punished by God and have to pay punishment that God gave you that he also calls Jesus to pay for, that's a double punishment. You know what a double punishment is? You know if a judge requires two different people to pay for the same issue? That's called unjust. Here's what we know about the scriptures. God is perfectly just. There's no way you and Jesus will ever be punished for the same crime. And guess what? Jesus has already been punished for the crime, so he's not interested in you being punished because that would make him unjust, and he is just and perfect. So there's never a time in history where God is trying to punish you for your transgressions because Jesus was already punished for those transgressions. You follow me? But you go, but he just put him in timeout. Yep, that's exactly what he did. This is a massive timeout. He gets put on restriction. He goes to the corner, and he has a timeout. And why do you put your kids in timeout? Because they are doing something wrong, doing something that's going to hurt them, and they need to stop and think about their actions. No, if you're going, I just need you to never do that again because it annoys me, that's not discipline. That's punishment. Right? I need you to feel pain right now, but I need you to stop, and I'm annoyed by you. That's not discipline. That's punishment. But when you pause and go, I need you to think about this. I need you to consider. I need you to come to a better conclusion about what's going on. And so God puts Zechariah in a massive timeout. And here's why. And why I would offer this to be the most important part of this passage, particularly as it relates to the Christmas series. Is if I were the enemy, the one thing I'd want you to do this Christmas is move so fast through this season, be so caught up in all the mainstream culture of it that you wouldn't even pause to consider and reflect on the crazy and good story that it is that God gave himself as the greatest gift to you. So how do you do that? There's only one way to do that, by pausing. By pausing. And here's the thing about pausing. You don't like it. I don't like it. So Zachariah, God puts Zachariah in a ma massive timeout because here's what's going to happen as he starts to pause for a second. And here's what happens when you start to pause and the reason you don't like it. The reason I don't like it. As we pause and consider our life, we realize the wounds are actually deeper than we first realized. Our pain's actually greater than we actually realized. Those words that your parents said to you, your spouse said to you, the things that your kids have done, those fears, when you sit and reflect on them, those wounds are a lot greater than you wanted to admit, and when you sit in them, they're really painful. Zechariah sitting, and he thought, I've served God my whole life, and I never could have a kid. And frankly, I'm angry about that. So what happens in that pause, the first thing, and it's not fun for any of us, the first thing that happens is our wounds are a lot greater than we want to admit. And that's why you don't pause. But as you put pause even longer, the next step is going, I don't even know if I can recover from those wounds. First step is, wow, they're a lot greater than I realized. Second step is, I don't even know if I can recover from those wounds. But if you pause long enough, you can get to a point where you go, but Jesus can recover me. This is not great, too great for Jesus. There's nothing impossible for him, right? So you come to this conclusion, a really good one with some real good self-awareness, that your pain and your sorrow is greater than you really thought it was, and your predicament is worse than it is. And so, um, here's the way that I would describe it. Do you want someone to stab you in the heart? That sounds like punishment, right? Well, it depends on their posture and how they hold the knife, right? If it's an anger and pain, absolutely not. But if it's a skilled surgeon with a scalpel, and you are on your deathbed and you don't even know about the cardiac arrest and the mess you're about to happen and your heart is no longer any good, the very best thing that could happen for you would be for you to be sedated, for you to pause and come to the conclusion that your heart's in a lot worse spot than you realized at first and to let a skilled physician come in and delicately carve that out. And the reality about pausing is the wound that we have is a really dirty, broken heart that is beyond repair. Which means, and once we come to that conclusion, we go either we are helpless and hopeless or there must be a God who can give us a new heart. And that is the story of Christmas, that Jesus ushers in a new heart. Elizabeth gets this, watch verse uh, 24. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant for five months, remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. She's five months pregnant. She hasn't had the baby yet. There are weeks, if not months, after babies are born in the first century where they don't get names because the possibility of them actually, uh, you know, the infant mortality rates are very, very high. So people don't talk about their pregnancies because there's, there's a really good chance they're not going to have the baby. And in this moment, Elizabeth's five months pregnant. She's going, God's good. God just did something that's beyond things. And then what's going to happen next is you're going to see this angel show up to Mary. This is so messed up. Briggs and I don't like musicals because they're silly. They're silly. Nobody breaks out in song in the middle of a conversation, except in the scriptures. So what happens is Mary, Jesus, a shepherd shows up, talks to Mary. You can come back next week and hear about that. Mary gets so excited. She breaks out in song. 
But that's not the only song that breaks out. Then it comes back to this in verse 57. It says this, When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, the, uh, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy, and they shared her joy. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child. Right? Came to circumcise the child. Lots we can say about that. Really, really complicated points to Scripture. And you're going, but do you understand what they're doing to a kid? They are picking up a hatchet and doing damage to a child's genitalia. The parents are choosing this. They're choosing this, right? And they're going, no, it's okay. They'll get old. They won't feel it. No, they do feel it. Then why are you okay with this? The reason they're okay with it, for a couple of reasons. One, because it points to this sign of believing God. The second one is for some hygiene reasons that they made those decisions back then, right? They literally put their son underneath the scaffold because it was good for them. It's called discipline, right? And so they even see the picture there. So eight days later, uh, uh, circumcised the child, and they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. But his mother spoke to him and said, he's to be called John. They said to her, there is no one among your relatives who's named John. Then they, then they made signs to his father to find out what he would like to name his child. He asked for a writing tablet, an iPad, and an iPad Apple Pencil. He got it for Christmas. It's nice, but it's the generation one, not too little disappointed. And to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, his name is John. He's God's gift. Immediately his mouth was opened, his tongue set free, and he began to speak. And what does he do first? He praises God. God muted him for nine months. He got to pause and go, the wound was greater than I realized, but you are greater than my wound. You can provide healing. And then in just a second, he's going to break out in song. This is twice at one chapter, high school musical, the Christmas edition, right? And so here's what we have. All the neighbors were filled with awe, and throughout the hill country of Judea, people were talking about all these things. Everyone heard this See that word? Wondered about it. Asking, what then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with him. Wondered. See, this doesn't solve Zachariah and Elizabeth's problems. They still die. They probably don't see John graduate from high school. Luckily, they don't see him get beheaded, right? I mean, like, they're not going to make it to much of his life. This doesn't fix their problems. But what it does is, is it points to the one who does fix problems. So you go, what is the purpose of John the Baptist? Very simple. God gave him as a gift to the world for two reasons. To point to and prepare people for the gift of Jesus, right? Which is what every gift in our category should be for Christmas. It should point to and prepare us for Jesus to go, yes, you should enjoy good things. Why? Because in heaven there will be better things. And this points to that. You should enjoy good food. Why? Because there will be a great banquet feast. And the food you will eat will be able to help you taste and see in heaven for all eternity that the Lord is good. So everything you get should point to and prepare Jesus. So as the band comes up, we're going to sing the song about this truth and confidence that what God gives us, the great gift he gives us, is life. Right? He puts handcuffs on death and gives us life and mercy. And so there's two things we've got to think about. It's Christmas. Why do you get gifts? There's a reason for that. And the first one is this, because God gave the best gift in the world. Because he is a great gift giver, and the gift that he gave you was his son. His son. He wants you to receive that. He wants you to pause Understand the wounds in your life. Understand they're greater than you can solve on your own. And then understand that he gave you the gift of his son so that you can trust him. Not just for now, but for all eternity. But the second thing is, if it's Jesus' birthday, and I think we've got to ask it every year, what does he want? What does the birthday boy want for Christmas? And here's what I want you to get. I want you to get this morning. I think it took us a while to get here. One thing I want you to get there is John the Baptist was a gift. Do you understand that? The greatest gift was Jesus. The second greatest gift in the world were human beings. Guess what that makes you? That makes you a gift this Christmas. It makes you a gift. So he's not looking for you to buy another thing. He's saying, would you be a gift to this world this Christmas? Well, how do I be a gift to this world? Really simple. Same way John the Baptist was. Live your life in a way that points to and prepares people for Christmas. By the way, the third greatest gift he gives us is the church. And right now, maybe for the first time, you're hearing about because we're pointing to and preparing you for a king in a kingdom that you get access to. The greatest gift God gives you is himself. And in that, he brings you into a life, but not just for now, alternative. Would you consider that this Christmas as we sing this song?